Dute prosne. Vlechu. Ven conmigo. Come to me. Well, good morning. morning. It's good to see you all, and welcome to any one of you who might be joining us online or on demand later. We hope that you're having a wonderful spring break. Now, we are in the third week of our invitation series, and what we're journeying through together in this series are the various invitations of Jesus. He makes a lot of them throughout the gospel, and our first invitation Pastor Adam led us through was follow me. And it was really a conversation about what the cost of following Jesus is, the cost of discipleship. And last week, Pastor Leanne led us through the come and I'll give you rest. And we were just talking through what does it mean to shoulder the easy yoke of Christ? What does it look like for our day-to-day lives to live in that way? Now this week, we're going to be looking at Jesus' invitation that says, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. And if I could summarize this sermon in one sentence, it would be the importance of only drinking from Jesus. Our passage for this morning comes from John chapter 7 verses 34 or 37 to 38. If you have your Bible or your Bible app, please hop over there and join me there. Uh, So you have some background to the text, and it's actually really important. So sometimes background information is just fun and interesting to learn. At least I'm kind of nerdy that way, so I find it fun and interesting to learn. This background information is really helpful for setting the stage for why what Jesus said was so radical and important. Uh, Jesus is operating or teaching during the Feast of Sakoth, and this feast was uh, a joyous celebration of the Israelites, and it's really the embodiment of Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3, which says, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And what the priest would do during this festival is he would go and draw water from a particular pool or pond uh, and then bring it back to the temple and process it around the altar and pour out the water as a libation at the same time that the morning sacrifice was happening. And the last day of this festival was the greatest and the most exciting. They would kind of party all night in anticipation leading up to it. And instead of walking and processing around the altar once, they would process seven times around the altar, really celebrating the salvation that they would draw from the wells um, or the joy that you get from the, the drawing of water from the wells of salvation in Isaiah 12. Now, certain rabbi scholars said this about that feast. It says, you have never seen joy until you've seen the joy of this water being drawn. And so it was a big deal to the Israelites. They were celebrating the promised Messiah, the coming Savior. And Jesus, on the greatest day of the festival, stands up in all of the commotion and shouts in a loud voice, because that's the only way he could have been heard. He says this, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow within them. So what Jesus is saying here, in the middle of this giant festival with this large crowd around the symbolism of the water demonstrating their salvation, Jesus is saying, I am the Messiah. I am the fulfillment of this entire celebration. So if you were to read on in John chapter 7, immediately following, you would see some people are claiming and calling him the Messiah. Whereas others want to kill him because of blasphemy. This was a very contentious moment and a very audacious claim of Jesus. So all week as I've been preparing, I've been pondering over this one question. How do I come to Jesus and drink? Jesus is not a literal faucet, right? I can't walk up to like his arm and water pour out into a cup. I mean, it sounds mentally uh, ridiculous if we think about it and to have that expectation set. So what is he, what is he talking about? Uh, to answer that question, 
I've had to work through a couple different stages, and these stages are going to create the framework for our conversation this morning. And, and here's the framework. That our souls thirst. So Jesus isn't talking about a literal water. He's talking about a figurative water, which our souls need. Not all water is the same. And only drink from Jesus. This claim that he gives, let anyone who is thirsty, everyone is thirsty, so it's a all-inclusive claim, come to me, but it's also exclusive, only drinking from Jesus. We'll flesh that out, out in a little bit. As I mentioned, Jesus was not a literal faucet, so water was not going to pour out from him. The importance of this metaphor, then, to me, hinges on our body's need for water. And I don't know if you know this or not. Many of you are so smart in this room, so I'm sure you all know these things. Uh, your body can only go three to five days without water. It's not really a long time, especially when you contrast that to the body can go 45 to 70 days without food. That's a giant difference. Well, as I was digging into this a little bit more and wondering why so few days for water, 75% of our brain 75% of our heart, 85% of our lungs, 65% of our skin, even, get this, this one shocked me, 30% of our bones are comprised of water. So that when we stop hydrating and stop drinking in water, it does not take long for those organs or any other part of our body that's water dependent to start failing. And it made me think, okay, if Jesus is not talking about literal water, what, what is he talking about? So what does our soul need the same way that our body needs water? I think the answer to that question is happiness. Happiness is the water of our souls. And this traces all the way back to this ancient philosopher by the name of Aristotle who was writing kind of 300 BC. And this is what Aristotle had to say. What is the highest of all goods pursued in action? As far as its name goes, most people virtually agree, since both the many and cultivated call it happiness. What Aristotle is saying here is that we are wired and driven for happiness. What we want is to be happy. It's what gives us the motivation to get out of bed in the day. The hope that we can attain happiness is what drives us. It's even what has become the foundation of democratic society, what we get to experience here in the United States. Now, I'm hoping my wife, who was in the early service, uh, is a history teacher, so I'm hoping you're going to know where these words come from. Hear these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Are any of you kind of saying this along with me? It comes from the Declaration of Independence. And it really creates this setup where our founding fathers of this nation realize that unless if we have the freedom to pursue the things that make us happy, uh, it's going, people will become ungovernable because their whole drive is to attain happiness. Because we long for happiness, so deeply, we tend to drink anything that we think will make us happy. Now, here's the problem. Not all water is good for drinking. Not all water is the same. Do you all remember the water crisis in Flint, Michigan from like 2014, 2015 to 2018? Uh, I was serving in the Great Lakes Conference at the time, which is the same conference as Michigan, and this was big news. We had to help out with this water crisis. And here's a picture of the water that was coming from their pipes. Ugh, I know. Can you imagine? That's horrific drinking water. Uh, and it got me thinking how much, because what the, this is being caused by lead pipes. Uh, and their lead levels were far too high to sustain a drinking quality. And it got me asking these questions like, how much lead is safe to be in water? I didn't know the answer to this question. Where do you go when you don't know the answer to a question? Google. Google. Right. So I looked it up on Google. I was like, I don't know the answer to this question. Google will have some sort of answer. And I couldn't understand the answer. 
<laughs> I, was, I was reading it, and I'm like, I don't even know what this means. Uh, translate this into something. So the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, sets the lead limit for water at 15 ppb. And as I was running over slides this morning doing sound checks and stuff, uh, the person that helps us in the booth, Henry, asked me, he said, Dave, you sent me this. Is that right? I don't know what that means. I said, great, Henry. I didn't know what it meant either. Uh, but yes, it, it's accurate. PPB stands for this, parts per billion. Parts per billion. Here's another way to think about what's being said here. 0 0.015 milligrams per liter of water. I can tell I have so many lively math people here. <laughs> so many. I was an actuarial science major for a while, big math guy. I love this kind of stuff. If you're not, I'm sorry. Uh, want to take a guess at how many milligrams there are in a liter? One million milligrams in a liter. So 0 0.015 milligrams per one million milligrams is what is acceptable. This, here's another way. We're not talking about a percent. We're talking about a number that's so hard to measure, it's way under a percent. This is what it would, if, if we could write it out, this is what it would look like. 1.5 times 10 to the negative 6 power percent. Staggering. So here's what I learned. The EPA is clever. What they said there is there is no level of lead <laughs> that is acceptable for the human body to drink. It's an astronomically small number. It's tiny. Uh, we, we can't, we would never be able to see it, and only until recently have we even been able to measure such a small number. Now, like physical water, there's only two types of water we can drink, and here's my symbolism for our water this morning. We can do clean water, it's tinted this nice blue to remind me of uh, an ocean vacation, right? Um, Caribbean water, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but it really, it's so that you can see it. Hopefully, you can see it better than a clear jar. And dirty water. These are our two options. Don't worry, this isn't really lead-contaminated water, although it looks like it. I was having fun with food dye this morning uh, and realized I need to play with this stuff with my daughter. She would love it. It was like making a lot of really fun things as I was dropping into the water. Anyway, I digress. Uh, we have the options of clean water or dirty water. In the Gospel of John, there's another story about water, which precedes Jesus' claim or acclamation in John 7. And that's found in John 4. It's the story of the woman at the well. In the story, Jesus is traveling back to Galilee. To get there, he had to go through Samaria. I don't know if you remember this story. You can open up to John 4, uh, verse 4, and it goes all the way to 26. I'm going to paraphrase it for us. I'm not going to read it verse by verse, but you can kind of uh, go through it as I paraphrase it. So it was about noon, and Jesus was getting tired, so he sat down by Jacob's well. Then a Samaritan woman came to draw water and asked Jesus for a drink. Or, I'm sorry, Jesus asked her for a drink. And she said, but you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? And here's where the conversation starts to get fun. Jesus says this to her. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked me to give you living water. The woman tells Jesus, this well is deep and you don't have anything to draw with. So where's this living water going to come from? She's playfully bantering with Jesus. A, she doesn't know what he's meaning, and B, she's being a little snarky. You're going to get me water, right? Okay, what, what do you have? To, this well is very deep. You can't get the water out of this well. And so Jesus says that this living water, and he explains it in verses 13 and 14. I'll put it up on the screen for you. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, the woman is a bit intrigued by this invitation of living water. She's coming to the well at noon in the scorching heat of the day. So think August in Tulsa, 105. Y'all stretch my imagination of what heat was coming from Ohio. Uh, and then think about what it would be like at 8 o'clock in the morning, 
right? Maybe a cooler 70 degrees, something like this. This, this poor woman was taking this giant jar made of clay, filling it to the brim with water in 105 plus degree weather, putting it on her back and hiking it maybe a half mile or more to take water back to her house. And Jesus understands the dynamic of what's going on. She's coming at noon because she has a life history. And this is where Jesus gets a little bit more playful with the woman and peers into her soul a little bit uncomfortably. So when she's excited about this water because the prospect of this physical water could change her life, she gets interested and asks for the water. And this is when Jesus gets personable or personal. He says that you need to go back and get your husband. And then I'll talk to you about this water. And she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right, you've had five. And the one that you currently are living with is not your husband. And then the conversation continues, which tells me because they don't ever start talking about spiritual water, that the woman hasn't put all of this together. By the end of the conversation, she believes because Jesus told her about her life that Jesus is a prophet. And she seems to even be able to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So she goes and runs and tells all of her friends. But she seems to miss this connection because Jesus uses physical water to make a point about spiritual water. Uh, She does not really process, the woman at the well, that when Jesus says, this water, he's not just talking about the water in the well. He's talking about the water in her soul. That whatever's going on in her heart to make her have five different husbands and to be living with a sixth person now is spiritually unhealthy. It's dirty water. And the invitation that Jesus offers to her is freedom, a different, a clean water. And although she gets the significance of who Jesus is, I don't think she leaves with the significance of what Jesus was offering. He was offering her life transformation. He was offering clean water. So here's the point. Sin is the lead of spiritual water. And there's no acceptable amount of sin that we can ingest that will not kill our souls. We are a lot like the woman at the well. And while speaking on God's behalf, Jeremiah put it this way in chapter 2, verse 13. He says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Jeremiah is talking about people who have not only chosen dirty water, they've chosen this dirty water, but they're also attempting to store this dirty water in mass quantities because they're afraid that they're going to run out of the dirty water. I'm going to take you, I like to think in mental pictures, so I'm going to take you on a little trip. Uh, If it helps, close your eyes and, and experience this with me. Imagine that you are hiking in the Colorado mountains, and for whatever reason, although you've left with the right amount of provisions, uh, somehow you've gotten lost about three hours into your hike. You can't find the trail back, and your supplies are dwindling, so you start to panic. And now you're realizing as evening is creeping in that you're going to have to stay the night here. And you're going to have to find shelter. And you're running dangerously low on water so much that you're feeling dehydrated and you, need, you know you need to find a water source. Well, as you look around, you come to find that there's a fast-flowing river to your left. Clear water, and it's moving. And then to your right, there's an abandoned cave that Yogi the bear has not yet occupied. So your shelter's taken care of. However, for whatever reason, you've decided that this isn't good water. You don't want to drink this water. So you go on another hike. You walk about another mile into the wilderness, and you come across a pond. It's green. It has algae growing over the top. And it has pipes sticking out that has some sort of very brown water kind of spilling into it. You've decided this is your water source. You're going to drink this water. Now, you have another problem. 
You don't want to keep walking back and forth from your shelter all the way to the water, so you decide to go back and dig kind of this pit that you can put the water in. So you go and you make this hike journey back and forth from the algae, nasty water to put the water into this pit, and the water keeps evaporating on you every time you pour into it. And you're stuck not being able to get any type of water. I feel like that's what we do with our spiritual lives. And this is the invitation that Jesus is offering us. He's saying, you don't have to drink the dirty water. I, I'm giving you clean water. And then Jeremiah is saying, you don't have to try to store up all the nasty water in a broken vessel that's not going to store the water anyway. I don't want you to have that water. I am the source. Keep coming to me. It's not your job to store up the water, and it's not your job to go find the water. I've given you the water. Now, I want us to experience a little science experiment, because I think that this is what we, we tend to do when we hear about Jesus. I think we hear and can hear in this message, we're drinking dirty water, we need to drink clean water. And then in our mind, what we do instead is we do something like this. We go, yes, I want, I want the clean water from Jesus. Of course I do. So we take the clean water. And we put it into our lives. But then... We're not entirely satisfied. And we decide, you know, I'm going to take the nasty water that I've discovered, and I'm going to drink that too. And we just try to add that on top, as if we can have both. And we try to ingest water like this. Now, I'm hoping you can see this. You see what they look like? I'm going to do kind of a basic math equation with you all. Uh, and maybe you can follow me with this. Clean water plus dirty water equals dirty water. Can you, can you say this after me? Clean water plus dirty water equals dirty water. Right? We can understand the basics of this. Now, I, I'm going to run a, another math problem by you because I, I think you are great mathematicians and you can handle it. Jesus plus nothing equals clean water. Can you say that with me? Jesus plus nothing equals clean water. That's where Jesus' claim and invitation is not only broadly acceptable or big enough to include everyone, but it's also exclusive. He's saying, I'm not asking to be another water in your life. I'm not asking to be an add-on. I'm not asking to be added into the water reservoir that you're already storing up. I'm telling you that I am the only source of clean water. Anything else that you take in is going to be harmful to you. So combining these two waters does not fix our issue. And I'm going to reiterate this point. Sin is the lead of spiritual water. Just like we were talking about 15 parts per billion and how infinitesimally small that is. There's no acceptable amount of sin that we can ingest that will not kill our souls. There's not. And so as Jesus is inviting us to partake in the clean water, he's not asking us to do this math of putting these two waters together and that we can maintain them both. He's saying, no, only I can quench your thirst. Thomas Aquinas put it this way. He said, it's impossible for any created good to constitute man's happiness. For happiness is the perfect good which lulls the appetite altogether. It is evident that nothing can law man's will save the universal good. 
This is to be found not in anything created, but in God alone. God alone. That there is nothing else. That there's but one source of thirst-quenching water brought to us by Jesus. He's saying, I, you don't have to go on and hunt for an algae pond. You don't have to start collecting all of that water from the algae pond and taking all of that useless energy to try to store it in a way that it won't be stored. He's saying, come to me and I will give you rivers of clean water that will restore your soul, that will cleanse you, that will enable you to experience a life that you could have never even thought was possible if you come but to me. And I want us to process this because I don't think we do a great job about this in the Western church. I think sometimes we use the excuse of life transformation and put grace in front of it. And we say, Jesus sacrificed himself so I don't have to worry about the water that I drink. And that's actually not what grace is there for. Grace is the gateway to repentance. It gives us the ability to repent. It does not give us the ability to keep consuming dirty water. And if you remember, repentance is this. It's not just saying, I'm sorry. It's saying, I'm sorry, and then turning around and going the other way. So the cross gives us this ability through grace to come to Jesus and say, forgive me for drinking the dirty water. I'm going to turn from that dirty water and come to you the living and clean water. So I have this invitation for you this morning. As we are in this Lenten journey, reflect. Ask the Holy Spirit to identify if there's even 15 parts per billion of sin in your soul, that he'll bring that up to the surface and that you can repent from it and that you might be able to consume clear clean, living water that will restore your soul. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it astounds us that you love us so much that you give us an infinite amount of do-overs, that we can come and lay at the foot of the cross our sin, and that we have the ability to turn from that sin. That you have created a way for us to experience a life we would have never have known. And that what we participate in today as we drink in that clean water is a participation in forever. In a way that we can only experience because of you. Lord, lead us and guide us to what that 15 parts per billion is in our soul. And help us to remove it. So we can enjoy you in Jesus' name. Amen.